Well, welcome back to the Journey Home program. I'm your host, John Mark Grodi, here at EWTN. And once again, we have this great privilege to, to think and to discuss what the, the Lord has done in our lives, the good things that God has done in our lives. Today, we're do- joined by Dr. Benjamin Lewis, former United Methodist. He is the Director of Translation Services for the International Commission on English in the Liturgy. And if you don't know what that is, you'll hear more about it here in a little bit. Doctor, thanks for joining us tonight. Thank you. Thanks Good for having share me. Your story. I really appreciate it. Glad to be here with you. I, I we look, you know, talked a little bit about your story beforehand. I know we have lots of things in common, lots of, lots of great themes that uh, often show up in these stories, but I'm so excited to hear yours, right? Every, every story is precious. So thanks for being here to do Thank that. You. Thanks for having me. Yeah. All right. Well, let's Let's go back to the beginning. Where would you like to start your particular story, your um, background? Well, uh, I grew up United Methodist, um, and uh, my parents grew up uh, Methodist. So three of my four grandparents were United Methodist ministers. So both of my grandfathers, um, one of whom was actually a seminary professor, so both of my parents grew up as pastor's kids in the Methodist church. Yeah. Um, and then after my uh, mom's dad passed away, uh, my grandmother um, went back and finished a degree and went to seminary and sort of took up her late husband's ministry in the Methodist Church. Um, so strong Methodist ties. Um, so I grew up um, in the United Methodist Church in uh, Rome, Georgia, uh, uh, and my parents are actually still members of the the church I grew up in. Wow. Uh, and I had a really wonderful childhood. Um, I have to say, growing up Methodist is not a bad gig. Um, I had a very loving, faith-filled family life growing up. We were very active. My dad taught Sunday school. My mom was involved in the children's ministry. Uh, My parents volunteered with the youth ministry. Um, And I'm the fourth of five kids, so I had three older siblings kind of growing up in the youth ministry um, ahead of me. Um, so I was involved in, you know, Sunday school and church every Sunday and, and uh, children's ministries in you know, midweek. And uh, once I got into middle school, uh, I joined the youth group. And that sort of became a formative part of my uh, experience. We were very fortunate. Uh, if you know anything about youth ministry, yeah. I think the average tenure of a youth minister in any type of church is maybe six months or a year. Uh, we had one youth minister who stayed at our Methodist church for 18 years. Wow. Um, so he was a big mentor for me um, growing up. And so when I came into the youth group at age 12 or 13, um, it was really, the, the youth ministry was really sort of picking up and, and growing. At its peak, it had 60 to 80 kids in the youth ministry uh, in middle school and high school. So, um, so that's sort of the background um, that laid the groundwork. Um, my journey to begin thinking about Catholicism really started um, as I was getting ready for high school. I went on a three-day uh, retreat experience called Chrysalis, um, which um, is a retreat experience. that There are lots of different varieties of it for adults and for youth. It's uh, sometimes called Walk to Emmaus or Tres Dies or Curcio. Mm. They're all variations on the same basic pattern. Right. Uh, a three-day retreat uh, based around 15 topical talks on Christian discipleship. And so the idea is you take, in this case, youth, um, teenagers who are already Christian, and you sort of help form them into uh, more engaging disciples for Christ. So I went on this youth retreat, and um, through that experience, I came away wanting to grow more in my faith. Mm -hmm. And they had a book table at the end of the retreat, and they said, if you want to learn more, uh, about your faith. Here's some books. Feel free to pick up one or two for free. And so I, I was a bookish sort of kid, and uh, I looked at the book table, and I saw a copy of Mere Christianity by C.S. Lewis. Yeah. Um, and so I thought, hey, you know, C.S. Lewis. I, I recognize the name, not just because it's my last name, but because I had read some of the Narnia Chronicles. So I thought, hey, you know, that sounds like a, a good title, Mere Christianity. So I started reading Mere Christianity. Uh, I was about 14 at the time. And it changed my life. Mm. It was the first book I ever read that got me thinking about Christianity. It's not just something true and good, but out of all the philosophies and all the religions and all the worldviews, Christianity is the one that really explains everything. Um, And I hadn't really thought about my faith in those kinds of terms before to sort of compare it to, hey, you know, there are other religions out there, there are other worldviews out there, 
but let's talk about how Christianity actually makes sense of reality. Right. right. Um, so for me, that was my introduction to apologetics. It was my introduction to sort of rational argument, uh, it was sort of my introduction to theology. Um, and I was hooked. I loved the way C.S. Lewis could communicate yeah. complex ideas in very simple, straightforward language. Um, real quickly, we're joined to, tonight by Dr. Benjamin Lewis, former United Methodist. I wanted to ask at that juncture um, about you know, th this concept of, of mere Christianity, reading this, which was just such a wonderful book. Again, the, Lewis is just a master essayist yeah. uh, in all sorts of ways. Up to that point, had you, what was your, in terms of Christianity and being a Methodist, like how did those fit together? How did you see yourself in relationship to other Christians or, or was mere Christianity already kind of your basic template? Yeah, I, I I don't know that I thought a lot about up to that point. I mean, as a you know, 13, 14 year old, I didn't really have a lot of exposure to other types of Christians. I mean, I I knew that there were Baptists and Presbyterians and maybe I could have named a few other types of Christians. Um, but I didn't um, you know, most of my experience of going to church was was in this one United Methodist Church. We were there every Sunday, we were plugged in. Uh, for midweek fellowship. We were there on Sunday evenings. Um, so, I mean, I, I was aware of other kinds of Christianity, but, uh, you know, as a 13-year-old, uh, how many 13-year-olds sure. how many have, you know, yeah, yeah. conversations about the differences between Baptist and Methodist? Right. I mean, I think at that point, I, maybe I was aware that, you know, there was a, Meth there was a Baptist church that, that um, on, our, on our same block, um, and I, I was vaguely aware that there was a, a sort of race to see who could get to the steakhouse for lunch sooner after <laughs> Sunday service. But that was sort of the extent that I was aware of other other faith or other other versions of Christianity. Sure. Um, did Catholicism fit into that? Where did that fit into that picture? Yeah, that I, I in middle school, I knew I knew of a few Catholics. I didn't have any really close friends, but I knew of maybe a handful of Catholics um, that were acquaintances yeah. in middle school and high school. So it wasn't something really on my radar screen. Um, but through the church youth group, um, through reading C.S. Lewis, I, uh, I, I just got hooked on reading. I thought, oh, this is great. And once I finished Mere Christianity, I said, I, I need to read more of the, yeah. the C.S. Lewis stuff. So I went on and read Screwtape Letters, and I read The Problem of Pain, and I read some of his essays and sermons. And I, I went on a, a big C.S. Lewis binge, if yeah, you will. Yeah. Uh, and after about a year of that, um, my dad came into my room one day and he said, you know, Benjamin, if, if you like C.S. Lewis so much, there's another author that I think you would enjoy reading. And I said, oh, okay. And he told me a little bit about G.K. Chesterton. Uh, and he said, there's a book of his that's very similar to Mere Christianity, and I think, I think you'd like to read it. I think we have a copy of it downstairs. Let me see if I can find it for you. I said, sure, Dad. And he came back later and he said, hey, I found that book I was telling you about. And he handed it to me. And it was Orthodoxy by Chesterton. Uh, and I said, sure, Dad, I'll give it a try. And so I started reading it. And by this point, I was a committed C.S. Lewis fan. Yeah. He was really kind of my first <laughs> literary love. Mm -hmm. um, and I started reading Chesterton. And about a chapter or two into reading Orthodoxy, I started to be conflicted because mm -hmm. I thought, wait a minute. All these things I loved about C.S. Lewis, this guy Chesterton, I, I hated to admit it, but I almost thought I, I might like him even more. <laughs> um, he's, not, he's not only clever and compelling, but he's also really witty, and he's, um, he's, he's got all these paradoxes. Um, and so finally, uh, by the time I finished reading Orthodoxy, I had to resolve the conflict. I had a new favorite author. And I, while I retain my appreciation for C.S. Lewis, that was sort of the beginning of uh, Chesterton from, from then on, was yeah. my new favorite author. What would you say this about those two guys? Because it, it's a common theme, right? Yeah. And it's not just that they're doing apologetics. It's not just that they're teaching about the faith. But both of those, I feel like they have a particular, they, they, they're good at sort of breaking you out of your, your mental universe yeah. and having you see the world through new eyes. Yeah. yeah. I, something about, I mean, I, I guess in Chesterton's case, you could say partly his journalistic background. Mm -hmm. He had to kind of write for an everyman sort of audience mm -hmm. um, and not having the same kind of formal education that, that Lewis had, sort of Oxford Don, 
sort of professional academic sort of thing. Chesterton was a little more like man on the street. Yeah. Um, but even Lewis, for being, you know, for being an Oxford don, um, you know, he wrote such simple, clear prose. Yeah. Um, there's just something about, you know, the simplicity of, you know, conveying very uh, deep insights, but in in common, you know, yeah, language. There's an I think there's an essay where he talks about that. That if you if you can't explain your faith or your beliefs yeah. in the common vernacular, the most common vernacular, yeah. you don't know them as well as you think you <laughs> right. do. Like that's the real test. Yeah, and there's a passage in in, in Chesterton's Orthodoxy where he talks about people that that just sort of use. Uh, I think it's an Orthodoxy. There were people that people that use uh, polysyllabic words to kind of yeah. move move the thought along, so you don't actually think. But it, but you really need to be able to. Um, Chesterton says a good test of if you really understand something is can you explain it in words of one syllable? Yeah, um, and I think that's a pretty good test. Yeah, I think that that's that's the reason they're both they're able to invite you into philosophy in its most important sense, which yeah. is to not to be relying to on definitions or books or sources. In the sense of again putting on the appearance of, of knowledge, but to actually enter into the ideas and take yeah. them seriously, like yeah. they really kind of break through and and they kind of convict you on no, I want to I want to search out the truth. I want to be in dialogue with yeah with uh, the tradition. Yeah. yeah, yeah. So I so I started reading Orthodoxy, and then I started going on a Chesterton binge. Yeah, um, and so I started reading some of his other works, um, and. Pretty quickly after I started reading him, I came up against the fact that he himself became Catholic later mm -hmm. in life. Um, and so that was sort of my first exposure to somebody, uh, you know, not an in-person contact, but through reading. I felt like I really knew Chesterton in a way, um, not that I was any kind of an expert, but I felt like he was a, a sort of trustworthy guide. Um, and then to sort of be confronted with the fact that he became Catholic. I thought, huh, I wonder what I think about that. And the more I read, the more I came up against his his Catholic books that he wrote after becoming Catholic, um, where he often quite openly defends different aspects of Catholic teaching. And I remember thinking as a you know, 15, 16 year old high school kid, uh, I thought, wow, this sounds reasonable, but I just don't know enough about Catholicism to know what I really think about it. Um, you know, is Chesterton accurately portraying Catholic doctrine? Uh, you know, is this is this really you know real Catholicism? So that was a question I had in my mind as a high school kid. Um, at the same time that I was doing all this reading of Chesterton and Lewis in my free time through the church youth group, um, I had a couple other strands of reading that were kind of um, running parallel. Yeah. Um, one of them was uh, my youth director started a theological reading club um, when I was about a junior, and he called it the Dead Theologian Society. Uh, and his, he, he did this whole scheme. We were going to start with the church fathers and start reading and do this whole comprehensive survey of theology, uh, beginning with the church fathers and going up through the Reformation and then John Wesley and then some more recent theologians. So we started with uh, Augustine's Confessions. And uh, we w read through the first eight or nine books of that, uh, the narrative section mostly. And then we went on to uh, St. Athanasius on the Incarnation. And then we did some selections of Thomas Aquinas. And then the plan was to go on and read Martin Luther and then John Calvin and then John Wesley. But by the time we got to Martin Luther, the, the enthusiasm of the group sort of petered out. Mm -hmm. um, and so when the first time we were going to meet and read uh, Martin Luther's Bondage of the Will, the only two people to show up to that meeting were my youth director and me. <laughs> so <laughs> at that point, he said, okay, I guess this, this project has kind of run its course. Um, so that was an interesting parallel track. At the same time I was reading Lewis and Chesterton, I was also getting through this reading group, uh, a lot of foundational Catholic theology through Augustine and Athanasius. And, right. um, and I was also doing some reading of St. Anselm on my own. Um, so that was kind of going. Um, and nobody bothered to warn me about reading the Church Fathers. Nobody said, hey, by the way, <laughs> we Methodists don't believe everything Augustine believed about right. you know, the Eucharist or the saints. Right. Or, 
Um, so I was just reading Augustine and thinking, this, this makes a lot of sense. Um, without realizing, I'm sort of imbibing a lot of you know, fundamental Catholic concepts. Yeah. Um, then another strand in high school, the same youth director on Sunday mornings was leading a Bible study Sunday school class where we did a, a disciple Bible study, which is a 34-week program where you go Old Testament through New Testament reading, I don't know, maybe about 80% of the Bible in the course of 34 weeks. Um, and when we got to the Gospel of Matthew, uh, chapter 16, the famous You Are Peter passage, at that point I was either a junior or a senior, I must have been a junior, uh, I knew enough about Catholicism at that point to know that that passage is the basis of papal authority. Um, and so when we got to that passage, I was thinking, why aren't we Catholic? Um, and so I asked my youth director in Sunday school that, that Sunday, I said, why aren't we Catholic? <laughs> I mean, I wasn't, I was expecting there was a reason. I was sort of inviting yeah. him to kind of explain, you know. Yeah. Um, and I think he was a little bit taken aback by the question. And I don't remember what all he said in, in response. But I do remember one of the other students in the class made some dismissive remark about, oh, well, you know, those Renaissance popes and their and their, you know, the corruption in the hierarchy, it's, you know, it's not a serious concept, this is a papal authority, whatever. And I remember thinking at the time, oh, hang on a minute. <laughs> I didn't know enough about Catholicism to know how to respond to that argument, mm -hmm. but I knew just enough to, to think, I'm not sure that's a fair response or a fair characterization of, of Catholic doctrine. So that was in some ways... A, a, um, one of my early exposures to the mischaracterization of Catholic doctrine. And, you know, if I could f fast forward, I would say, you know, impeccability is not the same as infallibility, mm -hmm. right? So just because the, the Pope is infallible in certain limited circumstances doesn't mean he can't sin. Um, but I sort of had this innate, uh, intuitive sense, oh, there's something more to the Catholic teaching than, than that Protestant response right. takes into account. Um, so I was getting a lot of uh, a lot of biblical uh, reading in. I was getting a lot of patristic reading in. I was reading Chesterton, and all of this kind of culminated uh, at the end of high school. I can remember being in a Sunday night fellowship, um, and we were uh, we were instructed to sort of take some time to reflect and kind of pray, and and we were invited to write down on a piece of paper if there was one question we could ask God about our spiritual life what would it be? And, I, and, and we, weren't, we weren't pressured into sharing that. So if you want to share what you write down, that's fine. But if you want to just keep it private, you can do that. But just take some time, uh, you know, everybody go pick a corner of the room and kind of spend some time alone reflecting and praying and, and thinking about if there's one question you want to ask God, what is it? Um, and after I thought about it and reflected on it, the one question I wrote down was, should I become Catholic? And I didn't share it with anybody. Um, I kept it private. And at that point, it wasn't an urgent question. I didn't feel like I needed to make a decision right then. Yeah. But it was a question I thought, this is something I need to think about and, and read more about and research more. And this is a question I, I want answered. Yeah. Um, so that sort of was the first phase, if you will, of my conversion. Uh, Chesterton talks about Three, he says there are th typically three stages of conversion. The first one, you're, you're sort of um, becoming uh, aware of the church being mischaracterized, and you, you begin by wanting to be fair to the Catholic Church. Right. Um, and you see that people are being unfair to it. So hang on a minute, let's be fair. Yeah. Um, and then you move to a second phase where you start discovering the Catholic Church and discovering that it's not just right some of the time, but it's but it's reliably right. Um, and that's kind of the phase I moved into when I started college. I went to Asbury, Catholic, Asbury College in Wilmore, Kentucky, uh, which is an evangelical school with Methodist roots. Um, and um, because it was a liberal arts school, I got a lot of general education courses and kind of abroad. Um, and because I had this question in my mind when I started, Anytime the Catholic Church came up in any type of course, whether it was like a Western history, Western civilization history course, or in a French class, or 
or in a theology class, anytime anything related to the Catholic Church came up, I was always kind of ready to to think about it and, and sort of relate it back to this question of what did I really think about Catholicism and should I become Catholic someday? Right. Um, so I had in college a number of helps to answer that question. Um, and one of the helps I had was um, through just through courses. I had you know, a Western history um, course where the professor um, talked about the Reformation and kind of he, and he and explicitly tried to to present a balanced picture of the state of the Catholic Church on the eve of the Reformation. And he, he made a point of saying, I want you to walk away understanding that it wasn't all bad, that there were there were things going on that were actually, you know, it, the church was growing and there were there were good things happening at the same time that there was some corruption going on. And then he had us read uh a story from Boccaccio's Decameron, which for me was a really, it's sort of a, a turning point story for thinking about this whole issue of, you know, papal authority and, and, and corruption in the hierarchy and how do those two make any sense together. Uh, and the story from Boccaccio's Decameron is of a, of a Jew from Paris who surprises his Catholic friend by deciding to convert and become a Catholic. Um, and he tells his Catholic friend, I'm going to go, I'm thinking about becoming a Catholic, and I want to go visit Rome oh, yes. so I can see, you know, the church leadership up front and close um, before I decide to, to join. And his Catholic friend says, oh, wait a minute, wait a minute. No, you don't need to go to Rome. And then secretly the Catholic is thinking, oh, no, if he goes to Rome and he sees the way the, the cardinals and, and the pope are living, he's never going to want to become Catholic. Um, so he tries to tell him, oh, it's too far. You should just stay here and talk to your local priest or whatever. Uh, and the Jew says, no, I really, really want to join. I really want to go make this pilgrimage to Rome. And so finally, he, he can't be dissuaded. And so uh, his friend thinks, okay, well, that's it. He's never going to join. But then he hears later from his friend, the Jew, he says, congratulate me. I'm now a Catholic. And he says, oh, so you didn't go to Rome after all. Oh, no, I did go to Rome. Says, oh, you did. You went to Rome, but you're, but you're still a Catholic. <laughs> And he says, uh, yeah, he said, in fact, um, <laughs> I saw all of the corruption in, in the church and it convinced me of the doctrine of the Holy Spirit. Because <laughs> I looked around and I said, all of these, uh, all of the earthly leaders of this church are, uh, to, to all appearances, doing their best to bring about the end of Catholicism. Yeah. Um, and if it were just a human institution, they would surely be ruining it. But yet, instead, it's it's growing and it's thriving, so it must be it must be the Holy Spirit. <laughs> um, and so, for me, that was sort of it turned the typical Protestant argument on its head and said, "Okay, you want to talk about corruption in the hierarchy? Let's talk about it. Um, maybe that makes it harder to to get around the Catholic claim that there's there's a divine uh, guidance happening, you know, in the, in the church." Right. Um, so that was that was something I was getting through through courses. Um, I was also getting a lot of um, interesting theological conversations with friends. Uh, a school like like Asbury, you're you're taking a lot of uh, Christians from different backgrounds: Methodists, some Presbyterians, some Pentecostal, some uh, sort of non-denominational. Lots of different stripes of of Christian, and you're putting them all together. Everybody's mostly everybody's taking their faith seriously but they don't always agree or they have different theological backgrounds. So you wind up getting some really interesting conversations. Yeah. Um, and so I had a really good friend who was a raised evangelical Presbyterian and was a very stout Calvinist. Um, and he was, kind of the, he was kind of the odd man out in a lot of these <laughs> sorts of conversations. There'd be a, a whole bunch of people from a Wesleyan background, and then he'd be the lone Calvinist staking out his position. Um, but there was one particular conversation that struck me. Um, he, we, somehow we got to talking about divine attributes and, and which divine attribute is the most fundamental or the most important. And somebody uh, on the Wesleyan side was saying, well, holiness, holiness is really important. That's really what makes God God is he's holy. Um, and then my, my Calvinist friend said, well, uh, uh, couldn't, couldn't you say that the holiness is really dependent on the fact that God is sovereign? And it's really, it's his sovereignty that's more fundamental than holiness. Um, and they kind of debated back and forth. And by this point, I was well on my way to, to becoming Catholic. Uh, and so I was, I, 
I didn't really feel like I needed to weigh in. I was just kind of watching this debate. Um, and, I, and I thought, this is interesting that it seems fairly evenly matched. Um, and I was sort of curious, you know, I wonder what the Catholic Church says about this sort of debate. Um, and I, I had started acquiring, even as a freshman, uh, a bunch of books, which is one of the other helps that I got to, um, to answer this question, should I become Catholic? Um, I started acquiring books by Catholics because I'd kind of learned enough in high school to, to know if I want to figure out what the Catholic Church really thinks or teaches, I should probably stop relying on purely Protestant sources. I should probably, you know, get some, get some Catholic information on what they, what they teach. So my freshman year, the fall semester, the, it was 2003, and the college library was getting rid of some, some of their old books. They, and one of the things they were getting rid of and selling in a, in a book sale was the first edition of the New Catholic Encyclopedia. Um, because the, the second edition had just come out in 2003, so they didn't want to have you know, two editions of the Catholic Encyclopedia. <laughs> it was too much for a Protestant school. <laughs> they just needed one edition of the New Catholic Encyclopedia. So they were getting rid of the old first edition, a whole big 19-volume set. They were selling it for $50. Now, as a college freshman, I didn't have a lot of money, so I really thought, I was like, $50? Can I, can, I, can I spend that kind of money? But I thought, it's 19 volumes. That's only a little more than $2 a book. That's right. <laughs> so, so I justified it, and I bought the set. And from that point on, for the rest of my time in college, it sat on the back of my desk in my dorm room. And any time I had a question about, I wonder what the Catholic Church thinks about Mary, or I wonder what the Catholic Church thinks about divine attributes. Um, so after that, that debate uh, around the cafeteria table about divine attributes, I thought, I wonder what wonder what the Catholic Church has to say about that. So I looked up divine attributes and I found out, oh, yeah, they do have things to say about divine attributes. And it's not holiness and it's not sovereignty. There's actually you know, the, the idea that God is, he has a saity. God, God has all of his attributes from himself, that he is who he is, his, his existence and his essence. Um, he's, it's not just that he has holiness, it's that he has it from himself. Right. He is the source of it. Um, and so that really helped me to see, oh, uh, it, it helped me to see a, a basis for the distinction between worshiping God mm -hmm. and venerating the saints. Because if God is the source of holiness, then he can give it to his saints and it, they're still not God. Because the holiness they have is pure gift. It's grace. Um, it's God's holiness. It's God's holiness in and through their life. Um, and so we can speak well of them. We can praise them in that sense without worshiping them, without, without saying that it's their holiness. Um, it's really God's holiness. And so for me, that was sort of a, a transformational understanding um, of that distinction and how you, yeah. can, you can honor the saints um, and still be worshiping God. Um, just like you would you know, if you see a painting and you say, oh, what a beautiful painting. You know, as long as you're still acknowledging and understanding that the painting didn't paint itself, right? Any praise you give to the artwork is praise for the artist. Yeah, what you find with a lot of those, when you get down to the essential Catholic teaching on these, you you find a preservation of both the common sense, mm -hmm. you know, the human, the very human response, of uh, to a mystery, but you also have the preservation of the mystery, and a lot of times the what we find elsewhere are. Uh, the reduction of the mystery to an oversimplification in one direction mm -hmm. or the other, but yeah. part of the, the the role of the church is not to create doctrine, but to preserve revelation, preserve yeah. true mystery, and not yeah. reduce it. So, right. Well, let's let's take a little break there, okay. uh, and we'll, we'll pick up your story again here. How this how this proceeded as you keep having these little threads, these little seeds planted uh, as you're considering. Uh, so we'll be right back. Uh, again, we're joined tonight by Dr. Benjamin Lewis. He's a former United Methodist, and now he's the Director of Translation Services for the International Commission on English in the Liturgy. But we're going to be back in just a minute to hear the rest of his story. Uh, you can also check out, check out a written version of his story uh, at chnetwork.org. It's entitled, Why and How I Became Catholic. You might uh, want to check that out and share it as well. It's a, it's a good story. So we'll be back here in just a few minutes to hear the rest of Dr. Benjamin Lewis's story. See you then.
Well, welcome back to the Journey Home program. We're entering the second half of our hour tonight talking to Dr. Benjamin Lewis. He's a former United Methodist and now the Director of Translation Services for the International Commission on English and in the Liturgy. And we're going to hear more about that in a little bit here. But we left off uh, really enjoying your story so far. Thank you. Um, and we left off here at Asbury. You have all these, these, these people, these experiences that are opening you up more and more to just, as you said, again, quoting Chesterton, being fair to the church. And that's leading to this openness. And so uh, pick us up back back uh, there at uh, Asbury. Yeah, yeah. So so that was really the period where I started really discovering uh, Catholicism through books. I was reading a lot of apologetics. I was picking up books here and there. I had the New Catholic Encyclopedia was on the back of my uh, desk in my dorm room. So anytime I had a question, uh, I could just I consult that too. I also had in college... A number of professors who had what I would call Catholic sympathies, where they were solidly Protestant, they were you know, Methodist or or some kind of evangelical, but there was one particular Catholic practice or doctrine that they appreciated, and that would sort of come out somehow in in their courses. Um, the the funny thing was that these professors didn't all have the same Catholic sympathies. They had different ones. <laughs> right. So that sort of helped me sort of one by one put some of the pieces together. So, uh, you know, I had a, this a Western civilization history professor who helped me to see, you know, give them a more nuanced picture of Catholicism on the eve of the Reformation. Uh, I had an English professor who was a Chesterton scholar. So I had many uh, enjoyable conversations in his office uh, about different things, sacramentality and and things like that. Um, I was taking a lot of French courses, and so I was taking courses on French history and civilization and kind of being exposed to a very Catholic culture in France, you know, with celebrations of feast days and things like this. Um, and so, uh, and I was also in a lot of music ensembles in the Men's Glee Club and the concert choir, and we were sometimes singing, you know, parts of the Mass, or we were, you know, doing some... Um, you know, chanting and that kind of thing. So um, I was being exposed to Renaissance polyphony, and and so lots of different things were kind of adding up. Um, so all of this reading uh, and and all of this com conversation with friends and different uh, different parts of history and theology and culture kind of coalescing, I, I realized I needed to actually visit a Catholic church. So it was the Feast of the Baptism of the Lord uh, in 2005. I just looked up the nearest Catholic parish to our college, uh, and it happened to be the next town over, St. Luke Catholic Church in Nicholasville, Kentucky. And uh, I went actually with my Calvinist friend, uh, who his, his mom had been raised Catholic and his grandparents were Catholic, so he knew a little bit about when to stand, sit, sit and kneel. And so he volunteered to go with me so I could kind of navigate some of the, you know, when to stand, sit, and kneel. And so we went together. Um, and I don't really know what I was expecting from attending a Catholic Mass. I just knew I needed to have this experience. Mm -hmm. But what, I, what impressed me about that parish was just how normal it seemed. <laughs> I don't know what I was expecting, but I thought, this isn't really all that different from a typical Methodist communion service. Um, maybe a bit more kneeling and, and more statues, but it didn't seem, uh, you know, weird or cultish or outlandish. Um, and I wouldn't have said so at the time, but I think it, looking back on it, I would say it was a bit like coming home for the first time. Mm. Um, but it definitely opened me up to the Eucharist um, in a way... Um, and I thought, I need to visit again. Um, so there was a, another kind of catalyst for this was that later that spring semester of my sophomore year, uh, the theology department at Asbury invited a Catholic priest to come give a talk on something related to Vatican II. I think it was maybe like recent developments in Catholic theology. Um, and he came and gave a talk. Um, and I think it was mostly for the students to kind of be exposed in general to, you know, Catholic thinking in light of Vatican II. 
Um, after the talk was over, I went up to the priest and I said, if somebody was interested in becoming Catholic, you know, are there any sort of catechism classes I could take? And he said, well, they're not usually called catechism classes, but there's this thing called RCIA, the Rite of Christian Initiation of Adults. And pretty much every local Catholic parish has a class and it's free and you can contact your local parish and the classes usually start up in the fall. I said, oh, really? Okay. So I looked it up and I contacted St. Luke Catholic Church in Nicholasville and I, and I joined their RCIA class that next fall when I was a junior. Um, and that was sort of um, the final step for me. Um, and that kind of pushed me into the third phase uh, of conversion that Chesterton says you typically have after a period of wanting to be fair to the Catholic Church and then a period of sort of discovering the Catholic Church and realizing that it's a reliable source of wisdom. Then that third phase is where you're trying not to be converted. <laughs> you sort of see where you're headed yeah. and you're trying to put the brakes on. Um, and for me, it didn't really take a very dramatic form, but uh, in that final phase of trying not to be converted, I was mostly putting all of my reading to the test, because up to that point, I'd had conversations with friends, and I'd been doing a lot of reading, and I'd had some influence from professors, but I didn't really have a lot of direct exposure to Catholics. Um, most of my exposure to Catholicism was through reading, and I thought, I really need to, you know, figure out if if real life Catholic parish life is is at all like what I'm reading in Chesterton or in Augustine or in different things. So um, I, I tried to immerse myself in the life of that parish. I, I started going to mass every Sunday that October. I joined the, the parish choir um, just to kind of have a behind the scenes look at things. I started going to uh, daily mass once a week um, uh, as well. And I, I started seeking out some of some of the people who had been kind of influential in my spiritual journey uh, to ask them, why aren't you Catholic? Because mm -hmm. I was hoping they would have reasons and explanations that I could apply in my own situation. Because at the end of the day, I, it would have been a lot more convenient to stay Methodist. Um, I wasn't exactly looking forward to the conversations I was going to have with friends and family to kind of explain why I did this weird thing of becoming Catholic. Right. Um, so I was hoping that I could sort of appreciate Catholicism, but keep it at arm's length. Um, but as I went in and talked to various people, professors and my, my old youth director, and, and asked them, why aren't you Catholic? Uh, the, they gave reasons, um, but none of their reasons seemed like I could apply them to myself. Um, so uh, when it came to uh, the Easter Vigil of 2006, I was confirmed. Wow. And I became Catholic. Wonderful. So that was 17 years ago. Yeah. Um, and I can say it was like coming home. Yeah. Yeah. You, know, you mentioned earlier that uh, one of the things that struck you when you finally had, had gone to visit a Catholic Mass, you know, was it opened your eyes to the Eucharist. I mean, what, obviously becoming Catholic, there's the doctrinal side, the intellectual side, but talk a bit about you know, experiencing the sacraments. What was that? Was a different, different view of the sacraments than you had as a Methodist. Yeah, I mean, the Methodists have communion. I think right. it differs from one church to another, but typically, I think in the church when I was growing up, it was maybe once every month or once a quarter. Mm -hmm. So not every Sunday service was a communion service. Mm -hmm. um, so that was sort of a different take. That like every time you come to church, there's there's the Eucharist. That's a that's a new thing. That was a new thing for me. Um, but I, I came to, yeah, after reading Augustine and, and all of these church fathers, and, um, and even C.S. Lewis has a very uh, sacramental understanding of the Eucharist. Right. Um, I just came to realize, you know, this is, um, there's something more here than just a symbol. Yeah. Um, and you read, uh, you read the scriptures and you read John chapter 6, and you think, okay, this is, this, he says, this is my body, this is my blood, um, and it's something more than a symbol. Um, so, yeah, I, I started to have um, a reverence for and a hunger for the Eucharist. Um, and um, 
yeah, going to confession for the first time was uh, so, sort of uh, nervous, but also just really wonderful. Yeah. Um, and you know, uh, going going to confession since you know it's it's not always um, it's not always that I come out of the confessional feeling like I'm I'm walking on clouds. Uh, sometimes I come out feeling like okay, that was the right thing to do, and I, I feel good, but I don't feel you know, uh, like I'm floating on air. But then sometimes you do come out and you have a profound sense of consolation. Right. Um, and that's and that's a good thing too. Yeah. Um, so I, I um, not very long after becoming Catholic, or maybe about four or five years after, I was um, briefly in the hospital for a ruptured appendix. And um, so one of my, one of the most profound consolations I received with a sacrament was receiving the sacrament of the sick. <laughs> and I'll probably not get through the story without choking up, but um, I was in Kentucky, back in Kentucky, um, for my, my younger brother's wedding. And a couple days after the wedding, I started feeling like I had a stomach ache, stomach bug. Uh, and I just thought it was a regular stomach virus. Give it a day or two, it'll be gone, fine. But after about three days of, of being sick uh, and th something's wrong, I need to go check out and see what's going on. And I went in and fortunately my parents were, were in town for the wedding and, and so they were still in town to help take me into the doctor. And um, by the time I, I got in and they, they gave me a scan and realized, okay, you're, you've got appendicitis, we need to take this out. We don't know if it's ruptured or not, but we're gonna remove it just in case. Um, I said to my mom, I said, can you call my confirmation sponsor? I'd like to receive the sacrament of the sick. And so he called the, the local parish, the same St. Luke Catholic Church where I'd come in, and a father, Patrick Fitzsimons, who was the parochial vicar there at the time, um, came out, and he arrived uh, in the hallway just outside my room at the same time that the ambulance crew arrived to take me up to the main hospital. And he stopped them in the hallway and he said, give me five minutes. Yeah. Um, and he came in and he explained to my parents, <laughs> I'm just going to say a few simple prayers. I'm going to anoint him with oil. And uh, it's very simple. And it was just a beautiful consolation to receive before going into surgery. And thankfully, I survived <laughs> and uh, everything was fine. But, um, but it took a few days in the hospital before they could release me. Um, but it was, it was just such a profound consolation. Yeah. To receive a sacrament in that moment, um, and a sense of uh, divine choreography that he arrived yeah. just in time to stop the ambulance crew and say, "You know, give me five minutes." And they said, "Hey, we've got to fill out some paperwork anyway. <laughs> Take your time." Um, but uh, yeah, so it's been it's been a beautiful it's been a beautiful journey since, yeah. um, and the reception of the sacraments. I love that phrase. I don't know, I'm not sure if that you coined that or you got it from someplace else, but the divine choreography of that. Right, and the sacraments really do. I was thinking throughout your story. You know, you talked about encountering mere Christianity, Lewis's great book, Orthodoxy by Chesterton, the early church fathers. And what's one thing that's interesting about all those resources, right, is that they're they're an, an apologetic for Christianity in its general sense, yeah, like the basic the gospel, and it's mm. kind of building up from there. Yeah, and they they go out of their way, Lewis and Chesterton both, to not put a label on it. Sure, to not draw the conclusion for you. They're yeah. just saying, what shape makes sense here? Given what we know yeah. of God, what shape does this make sense? You know, and then they leave you to draw your own conclusions. And, and I think that the sacraments, what, what's interesting about them in that context is that they make sense with the kind of God that we know we have. Mm -hmm. He's transcendent. You know, you yeah. talked about the mystery earlier, the, you know, the, he is his essence and all that. But he chooses, he has mm -hmm. chosen to be, to enter into his story and to be, you know, profoundly imminent. Yeah. And so the sacraments are like, yeah, this this great meeting of, of yeah. they do both, right? Uh, yeah. Hmm. Well, let's uh, again. That's thanks for sharing that that anecdote, a beautiful anecdote about the experiences of the sacraments. There. Let's bring it up to the present a little bit. You know, what's what's been going on since you've become Catholic? You know, some of your experiences and your your work now also. Yeah. So I graduated from college. Um, I uh, became Catholic in my junior year and then um, graduated from college and went to graduate school at the Catholic University of America. 
uh, and studied uh, Greek and Latin there. So um, for me, that was a, a really wonderful experience because I, not having grown up Catholic, I yeah. didn't have a lot of exposure to to different religious orders or priests or anything. And then suddenly I'm at Catholic University of America where you're walking across campus and you see, oh, there's a Franciscan habit and there's a Dominican habit and there's, you know, there are priests wearing their Roman collars and their sisters and, um, and you know, there's, uh, there's the Basilica of the National Shrine of right. the Immaculate Conception right there on the corner of campus. And so uh, it was suddenly I was immersed in a, in a, in a different kind of world and, and had access to daily mass at, at multiple venues. And um, so that was a really wonderful thing. I've been very fortunate to have um, daily mass opportunities and uh, teaching in different um, Catholic schools, um, doing some, some teaching for Catholic University of America while I was a gra in grad school. And then um, teaching a little bit for the Dominican House of Studies and for the John Paul II Institute. Um, so, um, so yeah, it's been it's been a wonderful journey. Um, and uh, I, my wife and I met in college, and we got married uh, at actually at Saint Luke Catholic Church. Mm -hmm. uh, so the same priest who confirmed me and gave heard my first confession and gave me first Eucharist also married my wife and me, and, and uh, baptized our first child. Oh, wonderful. So, um, so that was great. Um, and my wife and I, uh, after we got married, we moved to Greece for three years. She had been teaching in Greece uh, at a private uh, school, uh, teaching high school English. And so I was in grad school at the time and was uh, finished with coursework and just working on my dissertation, and so I could live anywhere. And so I thought, hey, you've got this job teaching at this English school in, in Greece. Let's, let's live there. Um, so we lived there for three years. And uh, shortly after we were married, I started working as a translator part-time for ICEL. And then uh, was full-time on staff beginning in 2018 as a staff translator. And then since 2020 in my current position. So we've been back in the, in the D.C. area uh, so I could work in the ICEL Secretariat in Northwest Washington. And what is, explain that organization a little bit and what, what they do. So ICEL, the International Commission on English and the Liturgy, we provide the official English translations for all of the Latin liturgical books uh, for the Catholic Church. So the Roman Missal uh, is the big one that most people would be familiar with if you're Catholic. Uh, you, know, you go to Mass on Sunday and there are set prayers and antiphons and uh, resp responsorial psalm refrains. Those are translated by our office. Um, we are first and foremost a commission of bishops. So there are 11 bishops from 11 different bishops' conferences. So the US, Canada, England and Wales, Scotland, Ireland, Pakistan, India, South Africa, Australia, New Zealand, and the Philippines. Mm -hmm. Those are the 11 member conferences. Each appoint one bishop to sit on our commission, which is, think of it like our board of directors. Mm -hmm. So the bishops are the ones who make the final decisions about our translations. Um, and, um, but then we have a permanent secretariat, sort of an office headquarters, that sort of does the day-to-day -day operation. Because these bishops all have a diocese or an archdiocese that they're in, in charge of. So right. they, they can't give all of their time and attention to the, the work of the commission. So we have the, the secretariat is the headquarters, and we do the day-to-day -day operation. Um, and we're a small staff of five and a half, um, five full-time and one part-time. Wow. And uh, I'm one of those five full-time. And so as the director of translation services, I'm responsible for coordinating with our part-time translators. We have a whole network of people that we work with. Um, we have people who work as what we call base translators. They're sort of the first step in our process. They do an initial translation that then goes to the editorial committee, um, and that's a body of about 10 individuals, bishops, priests, some laymen, and a religious sister. Um, and they take the sort of draft translation and work it up into a more polished form. And then it goes on to the ICEL commission, and they review it, and it goes out as a, what we call a green book. Um, and then it goes out to all the bishops of the English-speaking world, all the Catholic bishops, which is about 700, and they all have the opportunity to make comments on this Green Book draft translation. And we, as the Secretariat, take all of those comments and 
present them to the ICEL Commission, who then look at the text a second time with those comments and make changes and mm -hmm. adapt the text, and then it gets sent out as a final draft. Wow. Um, so it's a long uh, process, but my job is to kind of work with the translators and work with the different uh, members of the editorial committee to kind of coordinate that stage of the translation yeah. task. And again, in that in that title, uh, International Commission on English in the Liturgy, again, sometimes Protestants or other evangelicals who aren't familiar with the Catholic Mass can sometimes get the notion that Catholics don't take Scripture very seriously. The, the liturgy is all about Scripture. It's all based in Scripture. And we yeah. take it very, very seriously that yeah. the translation is right and that it's it's careful and that we're, you know, it kind of, it, it builds out of that, yeah. Yeah, it's interesting. Uh, I mean, as a Methodist growing up, um, you know, it, it, it differed from one Sunday to the next and from one church to the next, but you would typically have one or maybe two scripture readings um, if you did any kind of a responsorial psalm, that might be a way to get a third scripture reading in. Um, but sometimes just one, sometimes fairly short scripture reading. Um, and so for me, it was an interesting transition to become Catholic and realize you know, you've, got, you've got an Old Testament reading, then you've got a psalm, then you've got a New Testament reading, then you've got a gospel reading. Uh, and, then, and then most of the prayers of the rest of the Mass are, if not direct quotations from Scripture, they're, they've, they're shot through with scriptural right. language. Right. Um, so, yeah, so you're getting maybe two or three times as much scripture <laughs> read to you and, and prayed uh, in, the, in the typical Sunday right. Mass. Yeah, and that's just the Mass. Then we also yeah. have the Liturgy of the Hours that yeah. bishops and priests and nuns pray, and the, the lady are encouraged to, to pray along with the, the Psalms. We were talking about that before the show today. So, well, we, we have just a few minutes left, and so if you would take a moment... Uh, again, if there's somebody out there listening who comes from a similar background, you know, your fellow Methodists out there, maybe maybe they're in a place that you were in the sense of being open, being fair, but not sure what to make of the Catholic Church. Just if you would share a, a word of encouragement to them. Yeah, I would say something that was uh, encouraging to me from a, from a fellow convert, um, again, at St. Luke Catholic Church. Yeah. He was a deacon at the time, now a, a priest. Um, he said to me, he, he came from a Baptist background. Um, and he said to me, um, you, bring, you bring the best of your background with mm -hmm. you. You don't have to check it at the door when you become a Catholic. Yeah. Um, and that's something that you know, Chesterton says, the best of Protestantism will only survive in Catholicism. And that's something I've seen too in my own life is that while I'm not a Methodist anymore, and I don't claim to be a Methodist anymore, I feel like I bring the I hope I bring with me the best of my Methodist upbringing into the Catholic faith. And I, I don't have to, to leave that aside. And I, I, can, I can bring that with me and it can be part of how I live out my Catholic faith. That's good. Yeah, it's kind of like the story you shared earlier about the, it's part of the evidence, uh, I think, for the Holy Spirit guiding the Catholic Church that in spite of our sinfulness, in spite of yeah. <laughs> the humans who make a mess, uh, the church is held together, and you know, humans. We're not we're not aiming most of the time at things that are evil. It's a it's a matter of of organizing and negotiating different goods that we yeah. recognize. And when we try to do that on a on a merely human level, it's it's the our, our best efforts. We can't quite do it. But what we have, the gift we have in the church, is the Holy Spirit choreographs that brings all those goods together. Mm -hmm. You know, and so as you said, like uh, the very best of of your background. You know, you'll find it, I think, fulfilled and and completed yeah. in the Catholic Church. That's what we would propose. Yeah, know? yeah. Well, awesome. Thank you so much, Doctor, for sharing your story. Thank you. You know, and also for, for your work me. in, in yeah. ICEL. I you know, appreciate that. The Scripture again is such an important uh, part of our faith and the liturgy there. How we we learn proper worship and we engage in proper worship of the Almighty God. The Scripture is our great treasure there of the Church. Yeah, absolutely. So, thank you very much. And thank you for joining us for this episode of the Journey Home program. I pray that Dr. Benjamin Lewis's story is an inspiration to you. I want to remind you that if you're, if you're thinking about becoming Catholic, if you have questions about the church, that you can check out chnetwork.org. And what you'll find there is many stories, both video and written form, uh, like Dr. Lewis's. Actually, his written story is there. It's entitled, Why and How I Became Catholic. But you'll find, in addition to those stories, uh, a newsletter, an online community, and again, most importantly, I think, you know, fellow converts, fellow people from a similar background to yours that would love to talk to you about the Catholic Church. 
you know, and we're not here, as my father has always said on this show, we're not here to push, pull, or prod anyone to becoming Catholic. But if you're on a journey, if you're seeking to go deeper into your faith, we simply want to pray with and for you, answer your questions, encourage you to just keep taking that next step forward in your journey. So know that we're praying for you. Keep praying for us. And we'll be back again next week with another story here on the Journey Home program. God bless.